I'll tell you what, I've got a, I've got a high level of expectation and joy for this morning. I'll tell you, if, if I use this vernacular, I think, I think normal preachers say things like visitation of the Holy Spirit, but um, so if I was a normal preacher, I'd say I had a visitation of the Holy Spirit this morning. I mean, it was just so rich. It was so powerful. Uh, just what God's doing. And God directed me to do And It's awkward when I start talking like this. I don't normally do it. Um, but God, God directed me with, uh, to do a, a couple things. But to preface it, um, you know, the three things that the, the word uses to analogize God's, God's power and God's principles are agriculture, you know, sowing seed, tilling ground, good ground, uh, military, and sports, those three things. And, you know, so for me, it, it's interesting. So I think, man, the word's written for men, but um, that because I'm a guy, that's how guys think, I think. Um, I told Roger Walsh, who's raising two teenage daughters, that I, I, I got up this morning and I, I was praying for elders, I was praying for leaders in the church. And I thought of Roger raising two daughters, he's got a wife, his wife, his house is a, and I, I had to get to a place um, with, with Pastor Sandy, I finally said, hey Sandy, because Taylor was like in college and the girls were at home and there were three of them and there was me and they're, they're all saying, yeah, you know, my, Sandy would say something and the girls would agree and I would completely disagree. And, uh, and finally I had to give Sandy, I said, Sandy, I'm a, do, I'm a guy, okay? I don't think like girls, okay? And I'm never going to. So you got to take a different track. You got to take a different route. But I, I laughed at Roger because that's, that's got to be his life now, is <laughs> going toe-to-toe with three intelligent women. Um, but I'll tell you, as I, I was thinking about this as athletes, and, and there's, there's games that all you guys or events that all you guys as athletes have been involved in. And, you know, it's fun and it's entertainment and it's, it's recreational. And, and then there's those games that... I played rugby, and and there's other rugby players in the room, and there's those games where rugby's a gentleman's sport. Um, in Europe, rugby's a gentleman's sport, and soccer's a hooligan sport. And um, well, I'll just leave it as that, at that. But uh, but it, there there there's some of those games, and those are these games that honestly I realized I that is why I played rugby is because there's those games where yeah it was recreational, it was fun, it's a gentleman's sport. But this is going to be a fight. There's going to be a war that's going to break out on this rugby pitch. And, but you know what's interesting? And even, even though and I, I had this expectation of the team I played for here in Tulsa and, and other teams that I played with that it's like, yeah, we, we can't, we're, not, we're not even thinking about losing this game. It, 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 this is a game. It's going to be fun. And, but there's going to be a fight. It's going to be a fight. And we're going to win. Okay, so that's, I, I want you to know, that's how I look at life, and that kind of is going to, it's going to give you an introduction to what God's put in my heart for today. It's the, the idea of how prevalent doubt is in the world. The world is about creating, not creating, manufacturing, and even developing and training us into doubt, where it's, it, 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 it's amazing, and it, like, we're, like we're rats in a cage, we're lab rats for the world, and, and how, how the word, so, so much of the word is given to us to eradicate doubt in our lives, in a doubt-filled w- world, that we eradicate doubt, and I think there's things we just live with because it's not that big a deal. Can, 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 I, can I remind you of the verse that's the little foxes that spoil the vine? You know, it's you, uh, it, why marriages break up, why families split, why things. It's, it just becomes an accumulation of little things, and it's like it's not worth dealing with anymore. And, and little things then, if anything big happens, man, we're not braced for the hit. And where Paul said to harden yourself to difficulties, man, that hit's going to come. But what are you going to do when that when that hit happens? And and um, this is going to be a fight. 
that this, this time in, in the history of, of our country and maybe even mankind, that there is a fight right now that is, and we've got to be able to differentiate between what, who we are as believers and, and simple doubt that is manufactured by the world, but it just sound, it sounds reasonable. You know, it's interesting, that word reasonable. That word reasonable, where Jesus said, why do you reason in your hearts? Or why are you, ta- why are you trying to take this, 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 this aspect of life that is totally contrary to the king, God's kingdom and make it reasonable? And see, I'll tell you, I, we, I'm guilty of that, and, and we've got to We've got to be in a place where we realize, even though it's, it seems reasonable, it's not God's kingdom. It's not what God's promised us. It's not our purpose. And, you know, the, what I want to do is, how many guys here, and you're, you're here, and it's the first time you're here, or maybe the second or third time, you're relatively new. Can you just wave to me right now? You guys, man, well, I want you to, I want to welcome you to Guts Church. I'm Bill Shear. Um, my wife, Sandy, and I, thank you guys for coming. Um, but I say that, and, and I'm, I, I don't mind awkward, usually, because I usually initiate it. And um, so, so I'm going to initiate a little bit awkward here, but I, I'm just going to be obedient to the Spirit of God. Is if, you're a, if you're a guest with us today, this isn't your church, but you came here for a specific purpose, maybe because you heard that we believe God, God's the God who heals everybody, every time, no matter what. Um, that, and, that, and I'm telling you, that's the stand of faith that we take as a, as a church. I, I want to say that's a stand that I, that I take, but then, man, I'd have hundreds of people that would rise up. And, 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 uh, but that's the stand of faith. You couldn't fit. The, the, the church would empty if I said everybody get up here who takes a stand of faith pertaining God being the healer no matter what. It, it might be that. It might be anything. It might be your marriage. It might be your children. You know, you might you might be in a place, but you're you're new here today, and and you're here for a specific purpose. Take a deep breath. I'm going to ask you to stand. If you're here for a specific purpose and you're new here, just stand. Okay, I'm not going to have anybody clap. We're not going to go all TBN on you. It's not going to get. It, it's not going to get any weirder than. It already is right now. When I gave my life to the Lord, the guy said, man, just lift your hand. If you don't want to give your life to the Lord, I promise I won't embarrass you. Next thing you know, I'm standing, I'm in front of the church, and I'm, I'm hating the guy. And, but, and so I'm, I, I'm kind of letting you guys know. It's, I was hoping there'd be one, and there's, there's a number of people here, that you're, you're here for, for a purpose. And, and what's interesting is the, the word of the Lord that, that God gave me for you guys that are standing this morning. And, and I want you to know that I, I don't, this is, I'm pushing the, kind of the limits of my public ministry when I start talking about a word of the Lord for you, okay? Um, I'm, I'm very careful about that. Like, people that have gone to church here for 20 years have never heard me say, well, God told me, and I'll say something. And it's like, because I don't, I don't talk like that. I'm, I'm, I, I let my yes be yes and my no be no, and God backs my play is what it is. But but you guys that are standing, Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Now, now listen to this. So I'm not ashamed. And I think there, there's, a, there's a whole message in that, in us not being ashamed. You know, I want, I want the young people in here, no matter, no matter what kind of pressure, whether it's vocal or, or non-vocal or, or whatever it is, don't be ashamed of the gospel. And I'll tell you why, because we've got this syrupy thing that we, that we, we'll, we'll take our Bibles and this is the gospel and man, I just love it and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of put the Bible to bed tonight and I'm going to, I'm going to be real sweet to the Bible. No, this, that's not what Paul said. And Paul isn't writing to average people. Paul's writing to the Romans here. I'm telling you, if you ask, if you woke Paul up and, and, and with a year left or two years left in his life and said, what's the purpose in your life? You know what he'd say? I got to get to Rome. I got to get to Rome. I got to get to the seat of power. See, so here's Paul. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Listen to what he said. For it's the power of God to salvation. And then he said to everyone. 
Now listen, the power of God to the God kind of life. See, when we go then to verse 17, it says, and, and we, it, it, it's by righteousness and it's faith to faith. Here, read verse 17 to me, Brad, can you? For it is in the, it is in the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, and it is written, the just shall live by faith. See, so, so it's the righteousness of God. It goes from faith to faith. So, here, so where you're at right now, why you're standing, that thing you're standing for, it by, might be a massive boulder or it just might be a collection of pebbles. Okay, whatever it is, it bears weight in your life. And see, it go, we go from faith to faith. What's going to happen is God's going to give you a gift of faith today pertaining that issue. And, and I'm telling you, this is real. I mean, look around the room. There's, there's, the, the, this is so diverse, and this is, I mean, it's just amazing. This collect, there's no way you could, you could bring this collection of people into the same room and it make any sense. I mean, any marketers in here, how do you get this? It's like, no, it doesn't make sense. There's people in here that love God. There's people in here that hate God. There's people in here that are, that are desperate for a move of God. There's people here that are skeptical. There's people here with white skin and brown skin and red skin and, and whatever other kind of skin. And, but it, it, see, but the whole idea is people come in here, and I realize this, and God showed me today, they come in for a specific need. And it's not just about ringing that bell for that need. It's that I'm telling you guys in the next seven days, this is awkward, I do not do this. In the next seven days, God's going to move on your behalf and you're going to, listen, the situation you're in is going to flip the righteous. You with me on that? God, I just thank you right now in the name of Jesus. God, whatever it is that they're standing for. God, this isn't just a regular game for us. God, this isn't just recreation. God, we turn this into a fight. And God, though we walk in the flesh, we don't fight or war according to the flesh. But by your spirit, devil, I bind you right now in the name of Jesus. God, and, and I, devil, I command you to, to dry place to seek rest and to find none. And God, I thank you right now. We give. I'm, I'm talking me and you, okay? We. We give this situation to you. And God, we thank you in the next seven days, it becomes righteous in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Give these guys a hand. You guys have a seat. <laughs> now I'm going to go to normal, regular Bill, all right? That was, that was like eccentric, hopefully not Benny Hen Bill, okay? I love Benny. Benny. Benny's a dude, but I just need to move on. Turn your Bibles to Philippians 3. Philippians 3, isn't it great to be here? Man, I'm, I'm glad I'm here. We've exalted God in the heavens. His glory's filled this place. I don't know the rest of it. You guys could start humming it or something, I'll pick it up. Not that I've already attained. I'm, it, it's interesting because I had, I, I had an, this guy, I was playing golf with this guy probably... I don't know, 10 years ago. And we were, we were he, he started poking the bear, kind of. And he was in the other golf cart. And um, I, I, I played orphan golf that way, that day. There were three guys. I, they picked me up. I became the fourth foursome. And, you know, and it's, it was at that time, at the, at the golf course that I was playing at, I'm Pastor Bill. I'm Reverend whatever. And, and so it's awkward for these guys, you know, because they're, that, that, a lot of times a golf round is just a party. And, and I'm down for that, too, but, but people don't know how to party with me sometimes. But uh, although I'm the life of the party, I might add, um, I used to be much more, but, and I'm trying, to, I'm trying to regain it. But, um, but this guy's kind of poking the bear about the tithe. And it's interesting because I, I, I was just letting it go. And finally, the guy ride with me. He goes, why is he doing that? I say, he's an idiot. And it kind of just slipped out. I heard myself say it, you know, and I don't know the guy I'm riding with. And, and he says... Uh, he said, no, for real. I said, well, because he's got a bone to pick with somebody, and I just happen to be the, the target today. And so finally, we get, he, he got to the point about the tithe. It's, it's just random. And we got to the eighth tee box, and finally, I, out, they're all up there, and he said something. He said something, well, maybe if, maybe if you tithe, that shot would have been better or something. I said, okay. 
you're an idiot. I just want you to know. I said, but, but you want to have this debate, right? He said, yeah. I said, okay. And at that time, it was 10 years ago, and I, I'd realized that I'd, I had been, I'd studied the word in my life for over 10,000 hours. And I, and I just told him, I said, listen, I'm gonna, you and I are going to go there, okay? We are going to break the tithe down scripturally. But I want to warn you, I've been in the Word for over 10,000 hours in my life. It's not going to end well for you, all right? So, so understand that. The, the tithe is God's, it's not, it's not just something in the Word. It's not in the law. The tithe is God's heart. See, because what God does is he takes a morsel, 10% of what we give him as debt, and he flips it, he transforms it into heaven opening up and gushing, pouring out into our lives. And he goes, man, and, and the, oh no, one of the other guys said, yeah, you are, pointed to him and said, yeah, you are an idiot. But, but, the, but the point is, is that in this, I want to tell you, not that I've already attained. This is what Paul said. I feel like this every day. I'll be real honest with you. Or I'm already perfected, but I press on. Okay, underline that, highlight that, write that down. I press on. This is a press. That, man, we got to push our way through. All right? That I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has already laid hold of me. See, the word's been preached over into our lives, so this word has laid hold of us. So now we've got to lay hold of it, all right? And brethren, I don't count my, myself as appreh I've apprehended. I haven't arrived. But one thing I do, one thing, everybody say one thing. One thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. And reaching, listen, it doesn't say receiving, it doesn't say accepting, it says reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Reaching forward. So much of our life, we're trying to reach back. We're trying to reach back into what we had, the back into, into the, the selective memory that we had about how good that time was. And then in verse 14, he said, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now notice the, the terminology here. It doesn't say that I press toward the the goal for the prize of the upward call of Jesus Christ. It says Christ Jesus. See, it's, it's not just random when it says Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus. When it says Jesus Christ, the action in that statement is man to God. When it says Christ Jesus, the action is God to man. So, so we go back to that verse, and he says, I press toward the goal for the prize. Now, it seems like it's my volition. It seems like it's my, it's what, what I'm doing. All I'm doing is initiating it. See, that's all we did. You guys that stood, and you guests here, and man, I hope you get a t-shirt, and your kids get ice cream, and I hope you come back. But the bottom line is, what we did this morning is we initiated, listen, God to take action. See, and this is what's interesting about the flow of our lives when, when people say, well, you know, God's in control. I gotta give like no, we put our lives in a position for God to be in control. Initially, I'm in control of my life. I'm in control of my decisions. You know, it's interesting, it's it, it, it it's it's so funky because because I feel like I gave my life to Jesus. I feel like I accepted Jesus as Lord of my life. Yet the word, Jesus said contrary. Jesus said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I'm like, nah, I'm really sure I chose you, Jesus. And uh, I've had that argument with Jesus. It's like, I, it, it, he's more bullheaded than me. But, but, the, but, the, but the issue is, it feels like I made the decision. But the reality is, all I did was initiate it. And that's what, that's what healing is. That's what deliverance is. That's what prosperity is. That's what love in your marriage is. The whole, the whole nine yards. We're not, we're, listen, the power of God isn't syrupy. The gospel, excuse me, the gospel of God isn't syrupy. It's powerful. See, that's what we've got to think all the time. It's power, it's power, it's power. Man, God's made us powerful. How does he transform us? He gives us power. To what? Tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the evil one. And nothing will by any means harm us. 
See, but, but if, you, if there's a shred of doubt, it's like the field of your heart. Your heart's soil. So if, if your heart has seed of weeds, weeds are going to grow. But here's what's interesting is the water, the washing of the water, the presence of God hydrates our life. So we come into the presence of God, it hydrates everything. It hydrates the good things that are, that are seated in your heart and the bad things that are seated in your heart. It does, that water doesn't know the difference between what's good and bad in your heart. Matter of fact, you don't know. See, that's why the word, that's why we, we, have, to, we have to bring the word into the situation because what God's word does is this reveals what's in my heart. That's what this does. It's the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I'd like to tell you that I don't have any unforgiveness in my life. But I'll tell you, there's times in my life where, man, I'll be somewhere and, man, the word will come up and, and I'll see somebody. It's like, God, I forgive him. God, forgive me for somehow. Why? Because that seed's still in there. And we've got to eradicate. We've got to cut that seed off at the root. And that's what's interesting. We can't, man, we're, we spend our life trying to dig that seed back up and, and, and the bad seed and the stuff. And what we've got to do is we've got to understand that, that in this, the word is what's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. That's why the word's so powerful. If we just keep the word flowing in our life, that bad seed's not going to take root. Why? Because the good seed, the, the, the seed of the gospel, is going to take over the ground. And we've got to, and then, so then what do we deal with? The foul of the air. The enemy coming immediately to steal the, the seed. The, the, the little foxes that try to take the fruit. See, and, and, and understanding this, it's real simple. See, I think we make this so complex. It's not complex at all. When it becomes complex, it becomes confusing. And the devil's the author of confusion. It's always, wait, wait, say that, and I'll, I'll do this a lot. Say, that, say what you're saying in a different way. And, and invariably, when, when we say that to people, they have to simplify it for you. Well, when it gets simple, what is it? It becomes God. And then it's the simplest form, and now what can I do? Man, it's a soft toss. Man, God's not throwing lasers at us, expecting us to catch them. Man, he's, 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 he's taking it, this, his word's valuable. He's just he's making sure you can catch it. Man, he's not gunning that thing. No, you know what? How does this stuff stick so much? Because God, what God does, God's the gardener. He's the husbandman. That's why, that's why when, when Je- when they couldn't touch Jesus because his, when he rose from the dead, Mary thought he was the gardener in the tomb. Perceiving him to be the gardener. Why? He looked, he looked like God. He did. But she saw him as a gardener. Is that interesting? See, and, and we have to realize this. When we go to the Gospels in the book of Mark, in the ninth chapter, Mark 9 and verse 17, then one in the crowd answered and said, said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. See, it, he, he, he couldn't speak, and, and he probably had um, seizures. And he, he, and it was, it, he'd foam at the, at the mouth. It, it was, and, and wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. Let me, let me tell you something here, just a little, a little byline. Don't be rigid. Don't be rigid in your marriage. Don't be rigid with me. Rid, rid, Brian, rigid doesn't, work, rigid doesn't work with me. Don't be rid, uh, when, when we're rigid, we're not godly. We're not pliable. Religious folks are rigid. I'm just throwing that in. So I spoke to your disciples, the guys that are supposed to be representing you, that they should cast it out, but they could not. And Jesus answered him, and he said, he said to them, and I'm, I, I do this, I do this, rare, it, it's rare that I do this, but I'm going to correct the translation here, because it's not translated accurately. Um, he answered him, and he said, oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? It's not actually faithless. It's, it's doubting. See, it wasn't that they had no faith. 
It wasn't that they didn't have big faith. Because remember, the Bible even says, if you have faith as a, as a mustard seed, if you, got, if you got a speck of faith, you could say to this mountain, be removed and go from here to there. If you've got a, 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 a bit of faith. See, so he wasn't talking about that. He was talking about doubt that was in their life. See, and that's what's going to, and what this is going to do in the, in, the, in the next verses, it's going to clear this up. And it's going to be powerful. Okay? Oh, oh, doubting generation. You see that? And let me just tell you, if we honestly brought every thought into captivity of Christ, how many doubt laced thoughts that we have, oh, it's crazy. See, and what doubt does, it, 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 doubt establishes limits. That's all, doubt, doubt's, that's all doubt's designed to do. Doubt is designed to establish limits in our life. But the God, but this, the, the God kind of life is limitless. See, for, but for us, to, for us to sit down and say, okay, man, the, the, my income is limitless, my exploits are limitless. My influence is limitless. My reach is limitless. For us to think like that, it's like, well, but why? Because there's doubt. There's, there's little shreds of doubt. There's a little seed of doubt. Okay? Then, then they brought him to him, and, and they brought him to Jesus. And when he saw him, immediate, when he saw Jesus, immediately that spirit convulsed him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. See, that's what those disciples had looked at. And if somebody starts foaming at the mouth, it's easy for you to doubt. <laughs> You're like, uh, wipe that stuff from your mouth before we get, go any further here. So he asked his father, Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, since he was a kid. So evidently he was grown. And often he has thrown him both into himself into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, that's what he said, if you can do anything, I, I just need a little, show a brother some love. I just need a little bit of help. If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. This is the cry of the world right now. Have compassion on us. And if you don't think that the world's not convulsing and seizing and foaming at the mouth, see, we've got to understand that. Jesus said to him, if you can believe. I better make my point. He's signaling me, evidently. If you can believe, if you can believe, all things are possible to he who believes. No limits. You feel, you feel me on that? Immediately the father and child cried out, Lord, I believe. Help my doubt. Help my unbelief. You see what Jesus is? See the, the whole thing. But when we look at this, at the beginning of this interaction with the disciples, that Jesus had translated as a faithless generation, you're thinking, oh my gosh, I've got no faith. No, you've got faith. You've just got sprinkles of doubt in it. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit saying, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Everybody say, enter him no more. Amen. Say it again. Amen. Say it again. Amen. This is key. Because now it's not just power. Listen to me. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, my, I'm about to, ready to blow a gasket. It's not just power. When he, when he went to him and he said, in, in verse 25, he went to him and he said, he said, I command you out of him. That's power. And enter him no more. That's authority. See, there's a difference. God's given us power and authority. Why do people get healed and then the cancer comes back? That's counterintuitive to me. People are healed. What are they? They're healed. How's that come back? They're healed. See, we have the power, but he, what he also did was he operated in that authority. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and he came out of him and became as one dead. So many, many of all the running people around him, they said, oh my gosh, the guy's dead. And Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him, why could we not cast it out? 
And he said to him, this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. What do we do? We pray in the spirit. We pray, we pray spirit and truth. When we fast, what are we fasting? The world's input, the world's influence in our lives. Things that feed our flesh. See, verse 29, faithless is actually doubting. See, we know the word, but we also know some wrong things. You know, I mean, there's, there's, there's new phrases, trust the science. Okay? I don't have any trust left for the science. All my trust is in God. I'm not anti-science. I'm anti-lie. I'm pro-truth. But I'm not going to trust anything other than God. The Bible says, let God be the truth and every man be a liar. No, no. What tree did God forbid Adam from partaking of? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You think, whoa, 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 why would God do that? That's not bad. The knowledge, we need to know the difference between good and evil. No, it's the intimate knowing of good and evil. Man, there's so much evil in our lives, evil all around us within arm's reach. It's not going to kill us. I'm still going to go to heaven. Oh my gosh, now you're negotiating. I don't get it. For, I'm talking to myself. Faith doesn't deny the existence of a problem. Houston, we have a problem. It gives that problem no influence. It gives that problem no authority. That's what our faith does. You know what's interesting? I was talking to a, I was talking to a pastor from out of town recently, and he's got a daughter who had, had was diagnosed with cancer, and, and, and they treated it, and it, was, it had another type of cancer that they'd never seen that, the, those two type of cancers in the same person, and they weren't sure how to treat it. They weren't sure, and then they tried this, this treatment, and, they, and, and it's all the diagnosis, and they diagnosed this. They died. Finally, I was talking to him on the phone, and he said, the cancer's come back. And I'm wanting to come through the phone and grab him by the face because I'd spent dozens of hours with him praying and dealing with this. And I, it's dealt with. And, and, and so he's on the phone and I uh, Googled diagnosis and was shocked. The definition of diagnosis is the identification of the nature of an illness or other problem by examination of symptoms. But but what struck me is the identification, that you put your identity in that diagnosis. Oh, my gosh. And that's where, listen, that's where this stop being, oh, we're we're, going to have a game. Oh, we're going to sing. And now, oh, now it's this, this turned into a fight. Faith is the identification of the nature of God's promises by examination of the word. You start examining your symptoms. Do you understand, Pastor Sandy and I, zero time Googled the the symptoms that she had. Zero. Zero. And you'll say, what is that? That's key to her health and and her recovery and her health. Because we don't know anything about it. We're ignorant of evil. Hebrews 11 says, now faith is now, right now, faith is the substance of what we hope for and the evidence of what we don't see. I mean, that's a mouthful. That's another, say if Sandy were here right now, she's in Indianapolis, and, but she'd be saying, Bill, those, that was three messages you preached. I know, so I want you to get your money's worth. For by faith, the elders obtained a good, by faith. By trust, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand, listen, by faith, we understand the worlds were framed by God's word. Okay, this is the, woo! I'm not kidding you. I'm ready to go. This, this is the, one of the most powerful things that's happened to me recently is God showed me this. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. 
The redemptive nature of God's word puts bad situations back to their original state, their original form, before they became bad. Just like it's similar to God redeeming us. See, God redeemed us by his word, and what he did is he took a 1979 sinful, decadent, heinous young man, Bill Shear, and he transformed him into his original state. I'm not him anymore. God's redeemed me. See, the Bible says the days are, redeem the time, the days are evil. Redeem, write that down. Do a little study on this. Have some homework. Redeem the time. Times, the days are evil. Are the days evil? It's, it's a simple question, yes or no, are the days evil? Yes. yes. What do we do? Oh, we better go and, we better go get the days in a headlock, give them a noogie. No, we redeem the times. So what are we going to do? We're going to live by God's word. We're not going to live by the news of the world or other opinions. God's word, is this my last statement? God's word, it's on my notes. It's right there in front of you. Yeah, that'd be a simple yes. Okay, write this down. God's Word drives out doubt. And, and I almost switched the wording of that. I almost said God's word drives doubt. No, drives out doubt. But the way I, the, the way I worded it was awkward, and I thought maybe we pay, people would pay attention a little better. But let me tell you, why, why, why do you have to be in the word, John? It drives your doubt out. Otherwise, that doubt's gonna, it's gonna be reasonable. Why do you reason? Well, what are you talking about? Why do you, you gave me a brain. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, here's what's amazing. The conditions of answered prayer are right there. Oh, my gosh, I want you to hear this, man. You feeling God's church right now? Man, there's conditions of answered prayer. Anybody want to know what they are? How many of you guys want your prayer answered? I'll grab you again. You want them answered? Yeah. I'll shake them. I almost said pee, but I don't think you say that at church. The rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You got to believe that he is, and he's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him, diligently seek him. You inquire carefully, you require of him. So that's hard, that's awkward. I'm requiring of God. That's why God gave us his promise and he put it all in past tense. So now I can require this of God. That's awkward, isn't it? It's like, what are you saying, you're demanding God? Yeah, yeah I am. Because what God says, put a demand on my promise. And put a, put a demand on God's word because you have need of purpose. No purpose without that. See, so, so, so many people, so many people in, in life have no idea what purpose is. You want to know what the purpose of God is in your life at some point. And you know what? The only way you do that is you, got to, you have to diligently, you, you have to know that he is. And he's, your, he's your rewarder when you diligently seek him. And when you, the people that know the purpose and people that don't are just simply, simply people that walk in the reward and people that don't. That's how simple it is. It's that simple. Thank you so much for tuning in to Guts Church YouTube channel. I'm Pastor Chano Trevino, the assistant pastor here at Guts Church. And on behalf of our leadership team, our staff, our church, it's our hope that this message met you right where you are. If it did, I bet there's someone you know who could use the encouragement of this message in their life. And you sharing it with them could make all the difference. The mission of Guts Church is to help people win. And you can be a part of that simply by sharing, or better yet, inviting someone to tune into Guts Church online with you every week. Take that next step to be a part of what God is doing right now in this moment in time by being committed to showing up, placing a premium on God's word, and receiving all that God has for you. You can share this message, gather your friends for services, make it a priority to make this the place you want to be. God has so much for you. I truly believe that. We love you. We're praying for you. Can't wait to see you soon.